What is a metaverse? Is it some kind of newfangled buzzword, or is it the future of interconnected social interactions? It's a question that many people seem to have these days, now that so many companies and developers are obsessed with creating one. Virtual worlds, multiverses, and even the mythical metaverse isn't necessarily anything new. And today, I was able to sit down with an MMORPG legend he was the lead designer of Ultima Online and the creative director behind Star Wars Galaxies. He was also the creator of one of the first metaverses that you've likely never heard of called MetaPlace. Now, he's working on a new cloud-native sandbox MMO through his development studio, Playable Worlds, Raf Koster. Buckle up for this expansive interview, and for the Too Long Didn't Read version, hop on over to MMORPG.com for a concise article over the conversation. One thing that I've noticed over the past several years, since the term metaverse really came into play, is that everyone seems to have their own understanding of what a metaverse is. And when most people think about the metaverse, the first thing that, that you probably, uh, I mean, most people probably have come to mind is something like the film or the, the book, if you're a reader, uh, Ready Player One, um, which depicts you know multiple fully realized worlds all within a huge virtual universe um, and then you also have some gamers and some developers that expect the metaverse to have aspects of augmented reality or virtual reality but is there a simple definition as to what a metaverse consists of or what it must consist of Unfortunately, the answer to that is no. There is no simple definition. Sorry, I, you know, I, I I wish there were. It um, I'd I'd get a lot less questions. Um, I think Ready Player One actually is really not that great of an anchor point for a couple of reasons. Um, one, uh, and this actually ties very specifically to MMORPG.com. Um, you know that Ready Player One's partly based on Lord British. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, right? So it's already a case of, uh, how to put this, of sort of one thing influencing another and then the reference looping back and becoming the reference for something else, right? Like Ready Player One is clearly like extrapolating off of MMOs, which themselves, you know, have been around and... Ready Player One is also kind of a... It's like the casual version of Snow Crash, right? And Snow Crash came out in 1992. <laughs> Classic science fiction novel. Um, but Snow Crash itself, Neil Stevenson is a gamer, is very familiar with technology, and he was extrapolating off of MUDs and Habitat and stuff like that. And he's the one who said metaverse, right? That's that's where we actually got the word. For a long time, we thought we got the word avatar from there too, but it turns out that the Habitat guys coined it in 85. So yeah, you've got this sort of mutually reinforcing thing, right? Where science fiction says something based on the games and then the games, a whole lot of people who started making MMOs in 1995 did it because they were influenced by snow crash okay so there's there's sort of that you decide <laughs> if it's a virtuous or vicious cycle i, I don't know uh, so so that's that's part of what's going on and one of the things that happened as early as the mid 2000s you know call it in the immediate post second life period there was that there started to be an emerging consensus that snow crash was bullshit that it was wrong, hmm. right? Like that, that the vision of the future that it presented had been a super cool extrapolation with a lot of truth to it. And it's a great book, but it was not a manual for technical implementation, right? And probably the biggest marker of that, which everyone will be able to see and recognize is uh, cell phones, <laughs> cell phones are not the point in snow crash right <laughs> and and you know there's a really clear dividing line in sci-fi for pre and post smartphones in particular right um any vision of our technological connected virtual reality augmented reality ubiquitous computing future that doesn't have smartphones as the linchpin is probably wrong <laughs> 
I would right? yeah, like I would say yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> And one of the things you can see in Ready Player One is that, like, it's godparent. Cell phones aren't a factor, it's, right? It's all about headsets. And, and it's like, well, come on. So what that means, though, is that for people who've actually been working in online worlds for a long time, right, we all had to accept that the smartphone was a thing, like – a long time ago, right? And that means that what our definitions of metaverse are have continued to evolve and change. And uh, even in science fiction, okay? So I think it's worth pointing, for example, at some post-Snow Crash sci-fi books, like Werner Vinge wrote one called Rainbow's End. Um, there was one by Cory Doctorow called For the Win, which very directly influenced by MMOs. It's about gold farmers unionizing in China. Um, I, I, if your readership hasn't read it, they should. They'd probably love it. Um, it. You know, those books tried to take the idea of what a metaverse might be a lot further. And a lot of the ideas in Rainbow's End in particular, because sci-fi ends up influencing cutting-edge tech, uh, a lot of those ideas have become cornerstones of how people think about the connected cloud AR, connected uh, smart glasses or whatever, right? Um, and that book has turned out to be super, super influential. When you hear AR people talking about layers, for example, it's, it's a rip from that book, right? So um, – that means that metaverse is fuzzy as hell. I, I mean, there isn't a simple way to put it, right? I mean, we're, we're talking about a science fictional idea that people are treating more or less as an implementation manual, even though most of them are dystopias, right? And, and trying to build what it is. So when I get asked what it is, I go, look, first and foremost, online worlds, whether they're MUDs or MMOs, the key thing that MUD versus MMO taught us is how little the client end matters, okay? And how important the server end is. And pretty much one vision that everybody has in common with metaverse stuff is uh, that, that sense of simulated place, simulated space, right? Which in the mid 2000s started to seem stupid because of things like Facebook which were not about place. Things like Twitter, which were not about place. And in fact, social media ate MMO's launch and stole all their all our best tricks. Um, there was a period where people thought MMO's would be Facebook, if that makes sense, right? There was Psy World in Korea was the most popular social network there. 50% of the population of Korea was signed up to it. And it was Facebook, but everybody got a virtual apartment they could decorate. It's gone now. Place is lost, right? The thing that happened, though, is gradually as uh, smartphones became ubiquitous, placeness has come back in. Because your smartphone is now a geospatial client. And so... Now what we have is a web where placeness matters a lot, whether it's Nextdoor or DoorDash or Maps or Waze or Yelp or, 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 right? Like placeness matters a lot. Locality matters a lot. Where you are standing matters a lot to what the web is like to you. And that means that despite a period where it looked like placeness wasn't going to matter to the metaverse it turns out it does and that means that we're talking about online worlds again anyway and the nice thing is there's a clean unbroken line going back to text months right mm -hmm. it's really easy to see you get an online world fantastic and it runs on a platform and if you get a platform that can make multiple worlds people do right whether that's UO Gray Shards or, or Deku Muds or whatever it is, right? Smart Fox server, you, you pick, right? There's plenty of examples. You get a reusable platform, people make a lot of worlds. 
The next thing they try doing is connecting them together. <laughs> okay. The thing that happens, though, is as soon as people start making different ones, they start to diverge. They start turning into different worlds. Um, at the extreme, this could mean a multiverse, <laughs> right? Which these days is a word that everybody knows because of, you know, Marvel movies. But that basically means hopping between alternate dimensions, right? Like, that that's what that means. So, no problem. That kind of is what it's like if you're going to hop between different UO Grey shards. Sometimes they're really different, yeah. right? You can go log into two different Star Wars Galaxies emulators and basically time travel through the history of the game. Right, same thing with any of the different pirate servers, emulators, whatever. So, multiverse just means start connecting together worlds run by different people that are different. Mm -hmm. At this point, I reserve metaverse for when that stuff connects to real world. Okay, um, and the kinds of things there are things like. Great, let's add real world shopping. Let's um, make worlds that are replicas of the real world, right? Like, let's have virtual tourism in Machu Picchu. Let's, you know, I, I always use Machu Picchu as an example for some reason, but, <laughs> you know, it's it's those kinds of intersections that start make something metaversy. And it's pretty clear that where big tech is aiming is to have all of this stuff connectable to via your smartphone. Because there is some sense in which if you are driving around and you use Waze, you're an avatar in Google's driving in MMO. It's not full 3D, but it doesn't matter. You've got a persistent connection. You're driving your avatar around. Instead of using a mouse and keyboard, you're using your actual car. <laughs> Geospatial is what's telling the servers where you're moving. You have awareness of other avatars. It's pretty crappy, not like you easily chat with the guy zooming by you, right? Nor should you. What Google is giving – nor should you, <laughs> right? The thing that Google is giving back to you is they're basically giving back to you just the mini-map mm -hmm. of their MMO. They're just the – actually, it's almost just like an admin view too, right? They're showing you things like density and stuff like that. But it's really easy to see that if you were running around inside of Final Fantasy, we could give you ways, right? Like, that's obvious, right? Any player can see that. We could give you ways, right? So the cool thing about online worlds and the thing that gets people excited about this metaverse future is that online worlds – gave us, you know, they lifted it from D&D, &D, but they gave us the modern notion of what a character or avatar is, right? They gave us the idea that you could have a virtual world that is a fake world or a virtual world that is a real world. You could take your avatar ID and run it around either one or both at the same time, right? When you start thinking about that and you combine it with how oh, today's versions of your character sheet, which include LinkedIn and Facebook and the rest, you combine that with today's versions of the magic shop, which includes Amazon and Alibaba and today's versions of your inventory, which currently barely exists, but you know, air tags and tiles are a thing now, right? Um, you can see how we're all going to end up avatars in various kinds of MMOs. Right. Like us as humans will, right? Um, that's metaverse. <laughs> and if you think about it, being an avatar in some in big tech's MMO is not necessarily a positive. We might be right back at that dystopia thing. That's the kind of thing that I mean when I say metaverse. Okay. okay? There's a whole pile of tech that that implies, <laughs> some of which isn't there yet, right? But yeah, that's that's really where a lot of that stuff is going, and it's also why I keep yelling about but, well, ethics. <laughs> yeah, and and we're definitely yeah. going to get to those points. Um, but you know, it, it's it's interesting because um, you know, a, a, as you are speaking about you know how the real world kind of interacts in ways with the virtual environment and how this is kind of like the metaverse or, or what creates 
um, kind of more of a meta feel, you know, some some of those aspects may take forms like, like you were saying, like a cell phone with, uh, you know, like a GPS location or something like that. Uh, but some of it may be augmented reality, some may be virtual reality. Um, but then you have these, especially with the way that the industry has been going, and, and it's something that you've spoken about, um, you know, we have also digital ownership, and then we have, you know, their own virtual economies. Are, are these, are, are there examples of, like, aspects that you see being paramount to, you know, a metaverse to uh, to kind of perpetuate it so that it's, I mean, I guess since it's part of the real world, it's not necessarily self-sustaining, but it kind of, you know, perpetuates what a metaverse is and, and what people view as, you know, what they want the metaverse to be. Oh, gosh. Yeah, the way I would put it is um, this isn't going to be an either and an or and a not. It's going to end up being a whole bunch of ands, right? It's going to be everything, all of the things you just mentioned, and not any given metaverse or world or subdimension or whatever we call them is necessarily going to implement all of it, right? When I started talking about uh, the fact that, for example, right now a lot of people are focused on the VR goggles, right? So much so that I've taken to calling it the goggles fallacy because I'm like, look, you know, something like Waze is still going to be a part of this future metaverse. It's too damn useful, frankly, for it not to be. So the question isn't going to be whether... Okay, that means right off the bat, you're not going to be using VR goggles while you're using Waze. They are incompatible. <laughs> so like, that's just one example. We can put paid to the idea that, oh, no, the metaverse is goggles only. No, <laughs> gone, right? Like We know that. <laughs> it, it, it should be obvious, except to people who are really focused on solving goggle-based problems, right? Um, which more power to them, those need solved too. It's just there is no like universal solution. The metaverse is about the servers. It is not about the clients. It's going to be accepting of as many possible clients as possible, just like the web accepts as many possible clients as possible. These days, if you make the mistake of buying the wrong toaster or juicer, they are clients on the web, right? We, we've seen that and we hate it, but, you know, we've seen that. <laughs> so, you know, we we – need to be aware that you know the whole internet of things and ubicomp and all of that stuff means everything is just going to be a client on to the web so it's it's more about does ways also see my linkedin does ways know that i'm also larping and pokemon does ways you know like that's the place where it gets more interesting and, and confusing and, and and all of the rest um but it means that one stake that I can put in the ground is metaverse technology is client agnostic. It doesn't care what the devices are, right? Um, but a lot of other pieces of metaverse technology that would be startling to, frankly, a web dev are completely not startling to MMORPG.com people. Mm. Examples would be, there are object templates that define what an object is like. And there are object instances of, oh, well, yeah, I have one of those. And maybe that's owned by somebody right now, right? Okay, that's actually a little bit of a weird concept in web tech. We don't entirely have it. But Amazon has been trying to build a template database of the entire world. And their template ID is called an ASIN. OK, it is a master ID that swallowed up other IDs like ISBN and ISRC and UPC and these other things. Right. As soon as you go, oh, that's just a template ID from which an object can be spawned. Right. Same as an entry in the monster manual is how I spawn an orc. Right. Like to an MMO player, that's like, well, duh. Right. <laughs> to people working in real world commerce there's a, a like a, a mental adjustment of oh 
oh, that's the mat. That's like the the platonic model, and then we have actual manufactured ones, and that can have an ID, and these can have an ID, right? Like figuring that out is part of what led Amazon to becoming Amazon. The ASIN is one of the most powerful tools in their arsenal. Nobody yet has the object ID. I have the sword. You don't, right? But that is what an AirTag does. It creates an object ID that you can stick on anything. And suddenly now you do know the difference between like, you know, if we had small enough tags, you could know the difference between this napkin and this napkin. Mm -hmm. And MMO does know the difference between these two, right? They each get their own ID number. Real world doesn't have that yet, but big tech sure wants it. Mm -hmm. Right? And we also know that in places where those IDs have been put in place, they've often changed the world. MAC addresses on internet-connected hardware is a unique ID. Um, that matters. Like, fun it's fundamental to our fabric of technology, right? I mean, we don't think about it often, but it is. VIN numbers on cars are an example of those. And one that many people don't think about, but that everything about our modern commerce hangs on is container IDs. Um, the container that goes on a truck and the container that goes on a train and the container that goes on a ship, those are the same container. And those number th those serial numbers on the side are an object ID system for every container on the planet. That's how package tracking works. Okay, and somebody invented that. It was actually a dude from North Carolina invented that, and it changed commerce because suddenly you could know, oh, well, if we standardize the containers, I can literally pick it up off a train and drop it on a ship and know where it is and take it off and put it on a shipping truck on the other end, right? Like that changed everything. So creating those kinds of data standards for the real world so we can digitize the world. That's a part of metaverse, and that implies a bunch of metaverse technology that we may not like, because after all, players have unique IDs. And, um, you know, what does that mean then for privacy and our history and our records and uh, surveillance? Because uh, MMO players also know once a player has a unique ID, the gods can see everything, right? So those those are the kinds of things that is like oh that's the tech that's the what a metaverse tech platform means well you know one thing that you you brought up earlier and 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 we're gonna come back and touch on on what you were just talking about as well uh but there's there's so many points for us to cover uh that you've that you've kind of breezed <laughs> through uh but you know you brought up you know multiverses and um when it comes to Multiverses. You're, you're talking about building multiple worlds, and you know, in in a metaverse, or I mean, even you know, in any multiverse, you may be even talking about essentially multi multiple games, right? Um, yep. But that's that's not really a simple task, really, uh, because no. virtual worlds. I mean, they take time to create, and it's it's not it's it's more than something like Star Wars Galaxies, where you could just you know jump into a ship and fly from Tatooine to Naboo. Um, we're talking about completely different experiences, right? Uh, but it takes development studios years to create even one world. Uh, so is it really possible to expect a true you know metaverse vision to even materialize anytime soon? So first, it's possible to build, but no, we shouldn't expect it soon. Anybody who's out there right now promising the metaverse in the next decade is selling something. Mm. Okay, it's not, this is not a short term, like, oh, this is coming along any minute now thing. <laughs> well, that's kind of interesting also because you created a project, uh, MetaPlace, right? MetaPlace is an open platform so that anybody can build virtual worlds. Um, that was, that was essentially a, a metaverse to speak of, but. I mean, obviously, it's not running now, but I mean, that was that yep. was kind of the vision of of a metaverse, or it was, yeah. and it worked. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, if if we look around things right now that are um, 
uh, let's call them philosophical fellow travelers or whatever, right? Like you can't exclude something like Second Life, but people will go, but that felt like it was one world, right? And actually the way it was architected, it was one world. It's just that everybody, everybody had a small zone, but the zones were stitched together into a seamless map. That's how Second Life worked. So every creator did in fact get their own zone, right? Um, if you had to teleport between zones and people could host those zones on different servers, different computers anywhere on the internet, we would have called Second Life a full metaverse, even by today's definitions, okay? And bear in mind, it fit the definition that we used back then. <laughs> it was a metaverse. <laughs> Today, we might not call it that because of, you know, Second Life had real-world interconnections. Second Life had shopping for real-world things. It had presence of brands. It had embedded... FPS games and cool artificial life models and virtual malls and art shows and live concerts with, by the way, an audience that wasn't just watching a canned animation. It did all of that stuff in 2006. Um, Metaplace did say, no, each of those zones is run by somebody and they could be different and elsewhere. When we started out, though, everybody hosted them with us. And we ended up selling the company and uh, to Disney before we got to the point of people being able to run their own servers anywhere, right? So it meant that you zoned in between different worlds. But one advantage of having them be completely separate rather than seamless is that it's okay if one of them was 3D and one of them was 2D. It's okay if one of them was pirates and another one was fantasy, right? Because your problem is when you have the seams <laughs> and you're like, wait, how do I walk from a 2D platformer into, you know, into, you know, the other, right? Like that's, that's why seams actually help in a weird way, right? They, it helps. It makes it better to build the kind of environment that, you know, people dream of for metaverses. So Yes, Metaplace, which I started working on in 2006 and which was available starting in 2007 and went away by the end of 2009, had live concerts with full bi-directional interaction. You could take classes in it and it connected to your courseware co stuff like Moodle and your grades could get reported in it. So you could actually do homework in it and it counted. Okay? It... it there were Amazon storefronts that people ran where you could walk around shelves and buy comic books and stuff. And, you know, and Amazon would ship them. Or there was actually a comic book store was actually a comic book store in Florida. They would ship them. So it was a storefront to their stuff. There was a world that read Shakespeare plays off the internet, spawned all of the NPCs on the fly, and you could walk up and say, I'd like to see the tempest today and it would spawn all the npcs and perform the play for you in real time it's impressive okay which is something it would be really oh, it was put together by like uh, i did the i made the globe i made the artwork but it was put together by one person a player put together you know a fully functional old globe system right those are the kinds of things that we kind of wish actually we had in our MMOs, right? Like it'd be, wait a minute, that would be super cool if I could go by the theater and it would perform entire plays. And sometimes that might make for a fun, a fun Friday night, right? Like, you know, so when you look back at the history of everything from Neopets to more modern things like core, when you look at Roblox, you know, I mean, the, the underlying tech to be able to build stuff with that level of interconnection exists. It's been done. The trick is you need to make a generic virtual world server that doesn't have assumptions about the game. Like, no, don't hard code the frickin' Holy Trinity into it. Like, leave out the, the tank nuker healer. Can't hard code that. Can't hard code a leveling system. Can't hard code a game system. Can't hard code combat. In fact, you might not be able to hard code movement 
right? It's got to be really generic. You got to draw the line at we simulate space. We have the notion of maps and environments, right? You got to architect it that way because otherwise there's not a good way to make both a 2D platformer and Tetris on it, right? So it's got to be a fairly generic server engine. And that isn't the instinct people tend to have when they go to make a, an MMO, right? Like um, there's very few cases of MMO engine reuse today. That's a complete reversal from the MUD days. It used to be the vast majority of MUDs weren't just engine reuses. They never even updated the zones in the stock package. And so there was this stock MUD syndrome where you logged in. It's like, oh, my God, I'm here again. It's a different world, but sure looks the same, right? Like <laughs> that used to be a problem. Um, so architecting that way opens the door for things. Um, one good example of it is if you know, wow, my notion of a map needs to be really flexible. It leads you to the idea that maybe you shouldn't build the map as a giant static mesh. That instead it should stream down on the fly so that sometimes it can look like Tetris and sometimes it can look like a height field and sometimes it can look like a Lost Ark, right? Uh, because Lost Ark is clearly all the way at the handcrafted end, right? Like very evident. So that means nobody is adding seasons to Lost Ark anytime soon. It's incapable of changing. You freeze it in amber, right? Like that's, and that's a really typical way to make the games, right? So in particular, it's a very theme parky way to make the games, right? So once you go, oh, a metaverse tech way of doing this implies that it might be quite different world to world. And that means it implies that you need to stream it down on the fly. That means it implies it can change at runtime. And that's why in some ways something like Minecraft is actually a really interesting way for people to think about metaverse because Minecraft, you know, different kids set up servers and then they start adding plugins. If you teleport around the Minecraft universe, you'll find all kinds of crazy stuff, completely different feeling worlds, right? Now, people don't usually say Minecraft and metaverse, but... I, there isn't any reason why not like it would count right so what happens if you build that kind of an engine build that kind of a platform it leads you to different ways of thinking about what online worlds can do period and the potential that they have which frankly is old potential that we always thought they had that has kind of gotten lost <laughs> and in some ways we can even just kind of blame frankly we can blame the game industry for it uh in a weird way and the reason i say that is because when those of us who came over from muds we were all gamers we all made games right but those of us who were the earliest making mmos I think we all universally felt that they weren't just games. We all universally felt, no, these are like alternate realities, they're places. That's why we were all talking about rights and talking about player government and, you know, all kinds of big philosophy ideals. And you can go back and look in, you know, things like the mud dev mailing list where we were all debating stuff like wow could we make a world where the npcs actually build their own civilization without us right like we had all these crazy cool ideas and it was because we saw that sense of potential and i remember getting into arguments with people when i first started going to gdc because i would say i'm not sure those of us who do this are, are making games they're like of course you're just making a game it's a game it's just a game. Now, you know, I wrote a book all about how important fun is and <laughs> games. I value them pretty damn high. I'm, I'm surrounded by games here. So, you know, I value games high. But a game is something you put in a virtual world. A virtual world does not presuppose a game. But I would say that there's lots of things that WoW did 
and choices it made that made it the juggernaut it is. But probably the biggest from a commercial sense is that they reduced virtual worlds to game. Hmm. It was so clearly a, no, this is a game industry version of a virtual world. Right? Um, and, you know, we can have debates about sandbox versus theme park but it's hard not to frame sandbox versus theme park in part around how much are the players in control and how much are the operators in control and thinking of it as a scale like that and in minecraft this you know both of them are actually really high right players and operators both have a lot of control but you know, the classic theme park model, and now, we're, again, I'll circle back, Lost Ark, easiest to point at. It's like, you are going on a ride, and it's a great ride. Nothing wrong with a great, entertaining ride, but you're getting dropped in at the beginning, and you know what you, exactly what you're doing for the next 20 yeah. hours, right? You are on a rail, right? That, at that point, you go, well, world? Where's the world part? We before theme park and sandbox were the uh, the terms, we used to say worldy MMO, and that to me feels like something that's gotten lost. Yeah. And in some ways, metaverse is the worldiest of them all. There's 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 so many things to touch on uh, that, that you just brought up. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and take them uh, piece by piece here. But to, to start with, sorry, your... I give really long answers, no, <laughs> and, and there's nothing wrong with that uh, because it gives a lot of good information. There's just, there's just so much. You touch on a lot of different points really really quickly, and and I I really want to touch on all of them. Especially, I'm gonna start with your last point where you kind of you're, you're talking about the way that you know the way that you build worlds and and the way that worlds feel and uh, to gamers that that all kind of translates into immersion which is a big part of world building and and i feel like that's something that is really difficult to establish right um you know it, it, if metaverses specifically are are melding worlds together as they are and, and you kind of talked about well you know you could put seams between them and maybe it kind of in in some ways it may not feel like so much of an immersive transition but you can kind of pull yourself between the two worlds and and each experience could be individually, individually immersive exactly uh yeah. but you know when you're jumping from experience to experience and whenever you have like an underlying combination of experiences that that blends with the real world is this kind of going to be an experience that players will automatically feel immersed because it has that like real world no. authenticity to it yeah the answer is no i mean i wrote a blog post a long time ago the title i think was a question mark <laughs> is immersion a core game virtue mm -hmm. and i arrived at the conclusion that no and that was like ripping a part of my soul out <laughs> because to me that feeling of immersion is core to what games have meant to me and I think it's core to what a lot of gamers feel and want out of games. But it is not core to games. And it isn't core to necessarily virtual worlds either. And I think one of the big lessons, and this is where the hardcores versus casuals arguments come in and all of that, <laughs> is that it turns out it isn't a core virtue for an enormous amount of the world. Um, and the degree to which even immersionist gamers willingly embrace, well, I got to get five purples in this round. Or, um, oh no, it's okay if an achievement pops up during my gameplay. Like come on like first the world does not come conveniently divided into purples and blues and greens that's that's sheer gamey non-immersive stuff happening right um the fact that people um things people love okay 
think about the tension and immersiveness involved in transmog, right? Because true immersion would be you don't need transmog. You see what you wear and you wear what you are. But why do immersionists end up asking for transmog? Because the rules of the world are so rigid that you're getting forced to wear particular gear outfits at particular levels, and right? All of that is non-immersive. And then we put transmog on top of it as a patch to like try to bring back some of the sense of the dream. You know what I mean? Um, you know, having picking up freaking scout badges as you're playing games on steam and adding a card game layer on top of the entire thing i mean none of those aid immersion and the more they penetrate into the games the less immersive they are and yet we've been busily adding that shit for decades now literally decades so uh, it's obvious there's an audience there it's obvious that even people who prefer immersion often end up taking those things on board and running with them and uh you know i don't know if everybody always realizes the degrees to which their desires are getting damaged by their other desires that they're getting you know what i mean like you know we can ask for too much and it can end up being less immersive so <laughs> me i love immersion it's what i aim for right but i you know I also make product in a market with customers, right? And I recognize that there's an awful lot of non-immersive stuff that we end up doing in the name of accessibility, in the name of audience, in the name of whatever. And a lot of stuff would outright not be viable if that stuff weren't there. And in that, we can bucket pretty much everything people call QOL. Mm. Almost every QOL feature is non-immersive, but but you don't want to give them up, do you? No. <laughs> I mean, so and and honestly, it's, that, it's, the, the it's it's kind of gotten <laughs> well, it, it, especially with the rise of mobile games, quality of life features have really evolved over time, right? Because it's you know it's more than just hey let's let's get a mini map or something like that. Now it's it's hey let's you know auto path to wherever you're going hey let's <laughs> auto battle whatever we're fighting um and then there's a whole you know popular and this is way off topic by the way but there's the whole yeah. <laughs> there's the whole popular segment of idle games which is you're not even essentially playing the game anymore there's you know no real sense of immersion you know what the game is but it's yeah, popular it... I guess, and, and this I do think is kind of the thing that we need to, you know, to, to tie it back to metaverse in some kind of a way, right? <laughs> um, if, if we want to be forward looking about this, um, and, and this is the part that pains my soul, but I'll say it anyway, please don't all, you know, troll me after this, but <laughs> it might be that the path of the future isn't immersion, it's connectedness in a different sense, mm. right? Like, there's a different sense of connectedness that comes from uh, being in the orbit of something, right? Like I used to say, hey, um, and this was before the Marvel movies were everywhere and comic books like mattered again. <laughs> but um, I used to say, hey, look, the smart way to think about a brand or a fictional universe is, yeah, the people who reads – the Superman or the Spider-Man comic, yeah, they're your direct customer. But one hop away is the person who doesn't read them but watches, you know, the cartoon. And you push far enough, you get to the kids wearing the underoos, right? Like, it's still in the orbit. They're still connected to it in some way, mm. right? And, you know, we've only seen those sorts of tendrils, like, spread more and more and more, right? Um and weirdly, that is something that is non-immersive ways, but you're still in touch with with the, you know, it's like it all comes from an immersive root, right? That's It's just that when that root is far away, you get a little tendril of it. <laughs> um, and, but that that is a very metaverse way to think of this stuff, right? Because maybe the way to think of it isn't so much, oh, you know, the metaverse is all this real world stuff invading. It can also be the reverse. It can also be when I am walking around town, I get little trendrels of 
whichever fantasy kingdom it is that I'm emotionally invested in, right? There can be a lot of ways, whether that be Pokemon Go style AR gaming. It could even be, hey, I'm walking around in, you know, Cambridge or Oxford and I get little notes about Tolkien's life as I, right? Like there are many, many ways in which that stuff can flow out. So it isn't just that the metaverse is the world gets digitized into a virtual world. It's also that the fantasy worlds get splattered all over our real world. It goes both directions. Um, to me, the quintessential example, I used that Machu Picchu example earlier, right? The thing that bends the brain a little is when you realize there won't be a difference. Imagine we had absolutely perfect smart glasses or whatever, right? You won't be able to tell the difference between a remote avatar walking around the real Machu Picchu remotely and seeing other people and a person who is in Machu Picchu using the glasses who can see the remote avatars who are driving with a keyboard and mouse. Like, they're both connected to the same server. They're in the same zone. It's just that one of them happens to have a real world one too. And one has a virtual one only. But they're both on the same server. Their locations match. They know about each other. They could transact. They can interact. They have a... Like, that's the point where you go, oh, this isn't about take the real world and make it virtual. And it also isn't take the virtual world and make it put it on all the surfaces and tag everything. It's where they meet in the middle that the, that you go, oh, that's where we're going. Oh, crap. <laughs> you know, like, because it's just a little bit, you know, like, it's really easy to assume one or the other because we have examples of one or the other right now, right? Someday, somebody <laughs> goes and builds life-size Azeroth as a theme park and you can run around and LARP in it all day and log in remote. Like, that's plausible. That's not That's not crazy talk. You could build that today. The UI would suck, but you could build it today. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Um, but on the flip side of that, I, I think that more people, and, and we've already seen this, is that a lot of people are trying to have like a virtual Azeroth that they're able to experience more I guess immersively as a as a physical location um, and and you know, while you're right people could could create an, an Azeroth I, I think that, that we, we we're more eager to see the virtual uh, the virtual version of it um, because a, a lot of it's yeah, a, lot, a lot easier, lots, it's a lot, it's a lot cheaper yeah, a lot to cheaper, build, <laughs> a lot cheaper too. Um, so, so totally. So, touching back a little bit on, um, I guess more so, we're we're going to get towards more of the technology. You were saying that online worlds uh, and. More, more along the lines is when, when you need to build something, as you mentioned, like, you know, developers would need to uh, come into a space where it's maybe its own platform, its own engine, where they build new worlds uh, within, I guess, a, a universe or, or an online platform uh, within a chosen, I guess, metaverse. Um, it sounds like that's a big part of what your team is currently working on uh, for the most part. I mean, you, you talked about the technology a little bit. Well, yeah, um, yeah we did. We blogged some about yeah. it. And it, it yeah. sounds like, you know, what you're aiming for is, you know, obviously you're, you're creating a game, an actual, you know, MMORPG game, but you are building it on top of this technology that is, you know, a, a metaverse platform that's, I guess is it is it a platform that's created to build or for developers to build additional worlds? 
Is that? Uh, we're building it for ourselves right okay. now, right? Um, but I can get super, super concrete here, right? Because yes, we are totally, we're making an MMO. We're making a sandbox MMO, okay? We are making a sandbox MMO aimed at MMO players. We're doing that <laughs> just to be super, super crystal that's clear. Important. That is what we're making. <laughs> yeah, that's important. But the thing that we learned over the course of making past MMOs is that basically the platform you build it on, the engine you build it on, hugely affects what you'll eventually be able to do in terms of um, the kinds of gameplay you can offer, the kinds of flex flexibility and freedoms, all of those kinds of things, okay? So uh, I can get super, super concrete here. Way back when we did text games, we actually had enormous freedom because everything was text and it was cheap and easy to develop text. Oh, you want to make procedural dungeons with 10,000 rooms? Okay. <laughs> oh, you want to have people have the ability to create illusions of absolutely anything on the fly and drop them on the ground and mess with other players? Okay. Like, all of that was available. If you think about it, text is the original streaming technology, right? Like, all you need to do is send down a sentence and boom, something's there, right? Like, it's streaming in that sense. Um, but when we moved to MMOs, uh, the amount of stuff that we needed to get in the hands of a player was too high. And so we ended up having to ship it on a CD. And anything we shipped on a CD was frozen in amber. It was locked. We couldn't change it, right? We wanted to do things like Seasons and UO, and we couldn't because once we burned the map on the CD, that was it. It couldn't change. Now, we pushed the boundaries every way we could, right? We streamed down the houses, right? Player houses, not the ones built into the cities. In hindsight, if we could have streamed down the cities then people could have built their houses inside of Britain or expanded Britain or, you know, whatever, right? Like, if you think about it that way, it's like, oh, yeah, so we, we tried working around those limitations, right? Um, but we had to ship stuff on a CD. One thing that UO did right was that the, the game and the engine had a really clean split between all the game logic that was written in scripting language. It was called Wombat, okay? <laughs> Wombat was the scripting language. And when you fished, you weren't hitting the game server layer, you were hitting the scripting, okay? And I know that because I wrote fishing. When a tree grew fruit, that was done with scripting. When you cast a spell, the spell was written in Wombat, in script. All those things, even the guild system, okay? I wrote the first version of the guild system over a weekend in script. That's why it broke so egregiously. Um, you know, all of those things were done in script. There were a whole bunch of dev advantages to that. It was faster dev cycles. Designers could work directly on it because it wasn't as challenging as doing full-on server code, right? So it gave, it was almost like designers were modders of an engine. Right? It's like that level of just that much more ease. You have an assumption of, oh, well, there are maps and there's objects and I don't have to do memory management and networking, right? But you could just work on game sitting on top of it. And that is why we were able to build all of UO in two years and three months and still have more features than almost any other MMO ever made, right? Like that is why, literally, it was a technical reason. Um, that scripting model is not followed by all MMOs. Many of them do hard code, many don't, okay? Um, by the time we got to galaxies, we were doing things like procedurally generating the environment, not streaming it fully, but um, what we would do is we would define rules and send the rules down. And the rules, we'd actually bake some rules onto the disk and we'd send other rules for the proc gen down on the fly and we streamed them. Which is why in galaxies we could in theory blow a crater in the ground. We could flatten areas where your houses were and things like that. So it was like a hybrid and now we had a partially modifiable map on the fly. And that opened new things. There is no player cities without that. 
right? Like that opened that as a as a possible new entire area of gameplay, right? And games like Minecraft ran with that. Minecraft's fully streamed, right? Like, and so now we know what happens when you have a fully streamable environment. Players make amazing shit. That's the answer. <laughs> that's, that's okay, true. that's what happens. Um, we now know what happens when when um, you have, for example, in Minecraft also ran with this ball, but uh, longtime vets will remember UO's infamous dragon example and um, the way the crafting system worked in UO. Every log knew that it was made of wood. Every patch of water meant knew it was water and uh, and so on, right? That it was the basis for the entirety of crafting. It's also why the bug worked where you could fish in a patch of water, a rare patch of water you kept in your backpack, right? Like an item that hadn't been locked down. But without that underlying level of consistent simulation, that would never have worked, right? So that abstracted simulation is also a ball that Minecraft picked up and ran with, right? But it was core to how UO worked. It's also core to how the galaxy's economy worked. People who played Galaxies remember the shifting of resources underneath the map and the way in which that led to economic turnover and commercial empires and all kinds of other things. Those are, you know, things you have to supply as simulation layers in the engine so that the scripting can play with them. But a lot of MMO building does not have a simulation, frankly, underneath it. It it does simulation at the level that like an FPS does. It does basic physics and you know concurrency right and that's about it um by the time we did meta place we said maps should stream on the fly there shouldn't be a difference between what's on the client what's on the server that meant meta place you could log into and you only needed a client you didn't need a game install all the art came down on the fly it just lived on cdns so when you load it into a world instead of loading that stuff off disk the server would tell you urls and your client would download them off of URLs. And from that point forward, it proceeded the same. Okay. The fact that we could get there, right. And there were intermediate steps along the way, because, you know, that kind of idea um, was also implicit in how free realms worked. And that arose out of a technical innovation where we realized, wait, if the internet can stream pictures, that means we may be able to stream pictures off of a playstation one memory card that's how um everquest online adventures worked the memory bandwidth for the memory cards was really slow but we realized wait we may be able to store data on there and actually load stuff and save it there and cache it there and use it almost like a mini hard drive that was a huge technical like breakthrough for us at soe it enabled eqoa right and those ideas became free realms and some of them became meta place and, and and so on right so by the time we get to meta place and this became apparent once we were even even after we stopped doing metaverse worlds and we pivoted to doing um facebook games with it Okay, because we built the metaverse and nobody came. That's a thing. Um, you know, MMO players weren't that interested because it wasn't an MMO, right? Instead, we were going viral with teenagers in Brazil or whatever and couldn't. we couldn't afford it, actually. It, it's like, this isn't making enough money. Um, but when we said, oh, well, we're just going to make games with this, we were able to make, like... You know, yes, granted, Facebook games, so not the biggest games on earth, but a good Facebook game in those days took nine months to a year. And we were able to make one in a month. In fact, we made two in two months. And then we got bought immediately, right? Because we made three in three months, right? Um, because architecting things that way turns out it reduces iteration time for devs which means they can find the fun faster. It makes it easier to do art pipelines and all of that kind of thing. Um, stuff can change. The game can be more dynamic. It can evolve. It can, you know, be richer in that way. It's just a better dev environment than the traditional way of doing it, which is very single-player game-driven, even to this day. 
right? The major engines in use today, Unity and Unreal, were originally designed for shipping monolithic blobs on disks, right? So when time came that I said, yeah, let's do this and let's we're going to do this, um, we consciously decided, well, hell, we want to architect that way because we can find faster find fun faster we can build faster and cheaper that means we can make a bigger more expansive game we can offer more kinds of features with it and even the lessons about being able to reach out and interact with the web like downloading assets on the fly or you know even those wackier things that metaplace did with shakespeare and whatever right in today's world where players are streaming on Twitch, where they are hanging out on Discord, those should be engine functionality that you take for granted. Of course your game integrates with Discord, right? That's what thinking in a metaverse way means. And the fact of the matter is that you can make better games that way, even if you're not trying to build frickin' virtual malls, right? My first virtual mall, I built it in a text mode in 1994. Okay, there our local ISP said, hey, I hear you work on those cool virtual world mud things. I've lined up all of the shops in Tuscaloosa, Alabama that use us as an ISP. Can you build a virtual world that is a mall where they can each have a virtual storefront and their board clerk can sit logged in at a virtual, it's like, <laughs> sure, we did. Nobody came, but uh, but you know, it's not like these are new ideas. Before it's time, right? um, <laughs> it was arguably not before it's time. It's just a bad idea. Do you really need a virtual clerk to sit there and interact <laughs> with you in real time? No, like that's a waste of time. And people don't want to walk an empty mall. That's true. Right? Like that sucks. As you mentioned with quality of life, people don't want to walk a piece of world that they've walked before. A big lesson of virtual world design is that bigger is not necessarily better. Denser is better, not bigger. Big swaths of empty space, right? Like we have different expectations, right? It's So anyway, I mean, so we, yes, we have built that style of technology. But we've done it in order to deliver a better game. That's why we're doing it. It's letting us do things for the game that I am now going to tease and not tell you about <laughs> that are the kinds of things that MMO players have been dreaming about for 25 years. Gosh, I wish we had X, right? Building the tech this way lets us actually offer X. That's that's the that's the yeah. point. <clears throat> that Well... Going back a little bit in in what you're saying in terms of um, you know building worlds and how you mentioned that like in MetaPlace and and you know Minecraft games like that um, things can sometimes get a little I guess dicey whenever you start giving players the ability to build within a world which is which is essentially what a lot of games do. A lot of games thrive on it. You know, um, Roblox is a huge one that utilizes their massive community uh, to spur their ongoing experiences, and, and it's community-driven. Um, but on the other hand, one issue with the community-driven content is that you end up with a lot of content, but you may not really end up with a lot of quality content. You know, there's there's so much yeah, out Stur there. Sturgeon's Law remains in yeah. effect. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 90% of everything is crap with Sturgeon's yeah. Law. Yes. Yeah, that totally remains yeah. in effect. And Absolutely. That's, and, and, but in that same, you know, I, and it's different from the way that you're developing your metaverse, but a lot of metaverses, they, they talk about, hey, you know, let's, let's, you can own your land, you can own whatever, you know, you can build on top of it, you can create your own experiences and, and you know, all manner of that. Yeah. Then, so does does it require, I mean, especially in, in games like Roblox, where they consider themselves in, in some aspects a metaverse, or maybe they consider themselves mm -hmm. a proper metaverse, um, but 
that kind of, in some ways, they they make it seem like it presupposes that as a metaverse, you need to have that community to to build yeah. content. Is that necessary to run a, I mean, a, a metaverse? Uh, there's uh, uh, there's a couple of things there. First. At MetaPlace, we made what I now consider to be the signature mistake, which is that we we provided a great tool set and we were counting on players coming in. And we made a lot of individual gamelets, but we didn't give a world. Okay? We made lots of little games. There were like dozens of puzzle games and um, mini games and all kinds of things like that. We did a bunch of that. But um, but there wasn't like enough of a, a single coherent experience there. And Roblox basically – Roblox, by the way, was a direct competitor of ours at the exact same time. Roblox has been around since 2005. Okay? It took them a decade to get that going, right? Because – not only is 90% of everything crap, but really only the top 1%. That's not my line. That's You can look it up. Sturgeon's Law, famous sci-fi writer, Theodore Sturgeon. Um, really, you're relying on like a 1% to make stuff good enough that other people come there for the entertainment of it. Um, now, scale is its own solve, right? Like anybody who browses YouTube now knows it turns out there were Mozarts all over Earth and we just didn't give them the opportunity and the access. So if we needed to aggregate Mozarts, I guess Spotify is aggregating Mozarts, but <laughs> whatever. Like it, if we needed to aggregate them, it's now actually possible. So if Roblox crams enough creators into its platform, it will get enough of a 1% to build entertainment for everybody else, right? But that's a long road, and there's a question of does um, – there comes a point where you have to ask why are they doing it in Roblox, right? Not in their own engine, you know, whatever, right? Like all those questions come up. So that's that's one point. I regard that as having been a, a, our major strategic mistake with MetaPlace. We should have made one really cool game and allowed people to mod it and extend it because modding and extending is a way better on-ramp, which is point two. We have seen that work like crazy. There is no League of Legends and no Dota without the Dota mod. There is no Fortnite without an Arma mod that birthed Battle Royale. I could go on. <laughs> Every gamer knows the examples. I mean, there's not, there's no Counter Strike, right? Like, all of those things were born of mods, and and that's fine, right? Like, that's p totally fine. So, um, it does make sense to make sure you provide enough initial stuff. And I think Minecraft is the poster child for here's something where they gave a really solid start, and it was enough for people to run with the ball over time, and that great. Um, but that'll bring me to point three, which is, remember I to said it was a, a core part of my soul is the immersion and, and that. So um, uh, we're making a sandbox MMO with an original IP, a brand new setting with a pile of lore, with history to it, with flavor, <laughs> like, you know, it, because it's what I want to make. <laughs> it's what it's, it's, um, yeah, it, it, yeah, we're not, we're not making Minecraft, right? We're making a world for players who do want that sense of immersion, who crave that sense of, wow, this is an alternate reality and so on. Um, so it, it's, you know, the the thing is, those things aren't all contradictory, right? Like, you know, look at the look at the people who interact with any 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 IP. It almost doesn't matter, right? Interact with Lord of the Rings or whatever. And Lord of the Rings static. You can't change anything in it, right? <laughs> no UGC available in Lord of the Rings. They find ways. <laughs> they find ways to extend it and mod it and add to it. There are people who want their player housing in Lord of the Rings. And by God, they will build villages in New Zealand if they have to, right? Um, so I guess what I'm getting at there is that having a rich, immersive world 
is not incompatible with sandboxness, right? Like those two things aren't mutually contradictory. And I think uh, we've, I mean, there's piles of evidence of that from sandbox MMOs, right? I mean, you can just go back and go, you know, there was plenty of lore and I mean, Galaxies was basically built on Star yeah. Wars stuff. UO had the Ultimas. Eve has a very developed set of stuff, right? And yet they are, everybody goes, oh yeah, those are sandboxes. Like people pattern recognize them. So yeah, I don't see that as mutually contradictory at all. So <clears throat> We're going to get into uh, kind of, uh, a little bit of a tricky topic here, one that you spent a good portion talking about recently, uh, and maybe one that um, our readership and, and even a lot of people just in the industry are having a tough time kind of grasping, and that is ownership. Um, so... Ownership is a concept and topic that started <laughs> to take the gaming world by storm, you know, especially over the past few years as blockchain and NFTs garnered in favor of a lot of developers. Uh, but, you know, it, it's really tricky, and you, you've pointed that out numerous times. Um, there's definitely some uh, interesting potential uses for the kind of ownership that like NFTs could potentially bring to the table, but key features, especially some that you've brought up, like the portability of items um, across you know different worlds, the decentralization, uh, they're they're not really anything new uh, to start, uh, but it requires also both cooperation and coordination to make it all work, right? Uh, yet a lot of yep. the perceived pipe dreams of metaverses uh, that we see, especially to those who have watched Ready Player One, you know, and, and despite the dystopian theme of what they've seen where uh, we get into um, these virtual items that are ownership or you know, you'll find, you know, this grenade that only one person has or, you know, whatever. Uh, they think, man, wouldn't that be fun? But how important are factors like ownership, portability and decentralization? Uh, how, how important are those to a metaverse? That's a really good question. And I mean, uh, we could easily spend an hour on this. <laughs> so let me see if I can. The first thing, the first thing to think about is like the idea of having ownership over digital things got patented by Trip Hawkins when he was at 3DO doing Meridian 59 and he called it limited edition digital objects. So this idea has been around a long time, <laughs> right? Um, and it didn't go anywhere for a bunch of reasons, right? I think uh, a next major step was actually, uh, you know, there's this brand new website for trading Pez dispensers that had caught on at the same time as the UO beta. And then one day we saw somebody sell a castle there for $1,000 and we freaked out. And that was a moment of, oh, crap, right? <laughs> like, turns out the, the magic circle is leaky, right? Because um, there was this idea of this is digital ownership being transacted in dollars. And at Ultima Online, we made a decision. We said, this is an expression of player passion for what we're making. So we don't want to stomp it. We had plenty of legal grounds on which to stomp mm. it because legally you own jack shit. <laughs> and that is true for anything involving a server. Period. End of sentence. Ownership of anything digital is illusory. Period. A triple underline and bold. <laughs> Whoever runs the server is a guarantor. Okay. Now, here's where it gets meta, which is that in the real world, ownership of anything is also illusory. If I burst into your house and I steal your TV and I run away with it, you can claim it, you own it all you want, but I'm the one who can watch Netflix on it, right? Like, So in the real world, there is a guarantor 
called a government. And a government is what is guaranteeing, no, 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 this actually does belong to this person. So guarantors, you know, it's turtles all the way down. Okay. The problem right now with digital ownership is there's a really clear line where it gets handed off from digital ownership to or digital guarantorship to real world guarantorship. And the easiest place to pinpoint that line is at the end of the power plug on the server. Okay. Like whoever's got the power switch of a server they've got possession <laughs> like they, and it's pretty hard to get around that one right now it, it really really is even in all kinds of cool decentralized models there comes a point and you know we just saw this happen right like there was the big news article yesterday about the money laundering of bitcoin 3.6 billion whatever the heck it was right the takeaway in that story is it's all digital until it's not. That's the takeaway from that story, that there is a dividing line there that it's going to be very, very, very hard to erase. Given that I just argued for that massively blended metaverse, is it inconceivable it will be erased? No, it is not inconceivable it will be erased. If I had to lay money on who will be the guarantor of the future, a bunch of decentralized hackers who've been working on the problem for 20 years or, you know, 5,000 years worth of human development for of governments and civilization, I think that what will happen is that real world governments will swallow digital ownership and build it into real world standards. Not that we end up with a massive decentralized new form because I don't think anybody's reinventing human civilization with a bunch of uh, hackers on GitHub, and <laughs> it's just not happening, right? Like I, I, I'm real about this shit, right? Like, come on. So that said, the fact that people, there is a, a bunch of people who want this. There are really specific game lessons, right? Like Ultima Online, from an economic point of view, the reason it landed in econ books is because it ran a closed economy consisting entirely of limited objects at first. Remember, that was the famous closed economy we had to rip out. Well, that says something about building economies entirely out of limited edition objects. It blew up. It economically failed. And what's worse, it economically failed in a way that if we had been adherents of modern monetary theory, we would have predicted, which was that it fell victim to hoarding by the top percentage of the economic population 40,000 shirts in a house is the same thing as there is only 10 billionaires right like it's the same dynamics right so we know that a lot of the ways in which people want to do crypto currency based things don't actually work economically in long running persistent things they cause uh, uh, they they exaggerate Pareto curves. They lead to stronger rich get richer. That tends to freeze out newbies. It leads to uh, capping growth. There's there's a whole fin set of phenomena. And it means that people like us who were watching Axie, for example, we called Axie in September going, this is where they're going to be next year. Right? Um, because it was pretty predictable if you've done a lot of virtual economics design, right? Like the notion of you need to have sinks, right? Right now, the way that that works with NFTs is yes, you can burn an NFT, but all the social incentives are to not. Like that entire subculture is built around hold, 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 right? And, it, and, and that doesn't work, right? In the real world, the economy is built on drains. It's built on the velocity of money, not the holding of value. And that, you know, the, the faucet drain economy design approach that player driven economies and even the gamey economies end up using, they all use this stuff. And it, it, and 
a lot of it is because the, those first economists who went and looked at UO and wrote up and said, here, and here was the bug. Like, this is your design bug, right? We now all in this field talk in terms of economic faucets, economic drains, what are the sinks, how much is there, what's your hoarding percentages. We all use that lingo now because we've had to learn it to run these games. And even then, we still have horrible mudflation and the games break. So embracing a whole bunch of new rules that make mudflation worse ain't happening, right? Like that, it, we just have to get real. It's a long-standing problem we haven't entirely licked. The closest we've come, and this is the irony, is to have player-driven economy where the devs do not set buy and sell prices. Which is weird, because most MMOs, you want to be able to go to a shop and offload your trash right? But you have to realize that means you're creating a never-ending faucet that is effectively an economic subsidy on players. You're subsidizing their waste of time, frankly, right? Why are you gathering trash? Nobody wants it. Like, in the real world, we call that a subsidy. That's like generating milk that nobody wants to buy, but we're going to pay you, and the government buys it and then throws it away, right? It's literally a subsidy. Um, a classic MMO or MUD economy where you set all the prices is a centrally managed, top-down, exactly the kind of thing that we all run away screaming from. Ah, that's communist. Ah, you know, whatever. Like a centrally managed economy, it's too big and complicated to manage. That's why player-driven economies and sandboxes went away from that and enabled shops. That's why EVE. It is why Galaxies. It is why even UO, right? Like... Those choices were made because it let us get out of the way and allow the market to correct forces. And then we can control the faucets and the sinks, which is the same thing as controlling minting money and taxing. It's MMT. It's literally MMT. Um, so, yeah. So gold standard bad for MMOs. <laughs> Anyway, persistent is what it comes down to. It, 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 we, it's, it doesn't matter how we felt about it before we started. I think most early people in the virtual worlds were libertarian, okay, or had that as a, as a political streak. And then you actually run a world, and it doesn't matter. You, you get pragmatic about it. You're like, oh, guess what? Yeah, gold standard. The gold standard broke UO, period. It broke it. We now know. <laughs> like, oh, well, got to move on. <laughs> got to keep subscribers. Got to go, right? Because it took no time at all to break. Like, oh, my God, two weeks and the economy was trashed and nothing spawned anymore. It was <laughs> awful. So, <laughs> okay. So, um, does that mean that all of these notions are worthless? No. Um, how did we balance the UO economy early on? By watching the... Uh, exchange rate to the U.S. dollar. I would look and see how many gold pieces to the U.S. dollar. Because I didn't have great metrics dashboards. And if suddenly the value of gold on the open market started falling, that meant there was an oversupply of gold. And that meant we were spawning too much or there was a dupe book. And it was stable for like a year throughout the entire second age period at 400 GP to the dollar. Um, what ended up breaking it was actually Trammell and Feluca when those went in. And my suspicion is that PKs were actually a major drain, that they would destroy wealth because they only needed so much armor and only needed, you know, they'd spend the gold, but they'd acquire a whole bunch of high value goods from their victims and let them decay. And so that was a major drain. And when the game was made safe from PKs, that stuff instead accumulated in the economy and the value of gold tanked. Um, another argument against, in, this is why all my games have decay. Players hate yeah. decay. Well, tough shit. <laughs> <laughs> Tough shit. I, I, I don't have another choice. I have to have decay. Everything's got to break. Everything. And we saw this happen over and over again. You know, eventually, long after I was gone, Galaxies added the anti-decay kit. And their economy went to hell, right? It's, you know, it's 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 just a thing. And the real world shit breaks. So, um, 
so there's value even in just watching that, right? But the real place, the forward-looking thing, is actually about the intersection of two different legal regimes. And this is where we get very intellectual on you, which is the fact that over on the digital side, the prevailing um, legal framework is not ownership. In fact, there's two different preva prevailing frameworks. One of them is privacy law, which has not intersected deeply with games yet. We tend to think of it mostly as being about your PII, meaning your um, personal data in your account, okay? But like in the real world, your PII is an accumul is a, a data, we call it a trace. It is a trace of activities you've done in your life, right? Starting with your first birth certificate and moving on through things like you went to college, you got a new badge, <laughs> right? Like <laughs> those things, you started, your trace through life is kind of, that is personally identifiable. That's what PII stands for, right? Well, your route through a game is also a trace. We call them player traces. We use that for debugging. Privacy law currently does not apply to that. Thank God, because if it did, we couldn't run multiplayer games of any sort. Um, because we would be revealing your PII when we showed your character sheet to another player, <laughs> right? So, you know, that hasn't happened, but privacy has mattered a ton, as we all know, over on the social media side, which is doing almost exactly the same things MMOs do. They run chat channels, they run character sheets, they let you pick up badges and have reputation ratings. I mean, there's not a very big difference between a social media profile and an MMO character. They're they're very very similar, so it matters over there. It that part is not mattering to us in games. The other big area of law is IP law, and right now, if you make a virtual hat, like an artist working for me makes a virtual hat, the chain of ownership on that like goes through like multiple hands and the the thing that is at the heart of whether or not you own that hat when it's actually just bits and bytes in my database and I have given you a limited length time permission to log in and move selected bytes from one column to another. Like that's literally what's happening. Like in a very, very pragmatic way, you have permission to log into my database and use these very complicated controls to move one ID from a column one to column two. Like that's what's really happening. And under that entire IP framework of ownership, all that shit belongs to the company. It belongs to the, the database owner, right? The ownership collision that's super interesting to me is that the crypto and NFT enthusiasts are trying to bring the real world version of physical ownership into digital. But simultaneously, what's been happening is the reverse. Today, you actually have a software license for your refrigerator, right? Which puts it under IP law, not ownership. Okay, and if if you're really interested in in this, this is where the right to repair stuff comes from. It's where Section 230 of CDA ties in. It's where DMCA um, circumvention fines come in. This is the the entirety of that whole thing. It's everything from Aaron Swartz, um, RIP, to um, you know, wait, I don't own my juicer because it's internet connected to, oh crap, Mazda was allowing people to patch the cars using FM radio that just broke this morning uh, to, I mean, you name it, right? Extending IP into physical objects means that you no longer own something really. You possess the container of it, but it's like when you own... Not that anybody owns CDs anymore other than me. I still buy them. <laughs> it's the best way to get musicians paid, damn it. Buy CDs straight from the musician. Anyway, um, you know, you own the CD, but that doesn't mean you own the songs. With an internet-connected juicer, it means, well, you own the machine, but it doesn't mean you own the juicer, right? 
and hacking the juicer you own so that it works without being internet connected is now an IP violation and you can be fined. And um, Cory Doctor has written a ton about this. The quintessential story is unauthorized bread. It's a sci-fi story about a person who gets an interconnected toaster and um, it will only toast bread from the maker of the toaster, <laughs> right? Because you don't have a license to do anything else. That is making the toaster work like an MMO toaster, <laughs> right? So right now we see people wanting to take the real world notion of possession and put it into digital. But what's actually been winning, unfortunately, in my opinion, for a few decades now is the reverse, which is you're not owning anything. You're subscribing to it all. And that's, you know, so it, to me, it's fascinating that people are saying, no, let's do this. When in practice, what's been happening is the opposite. Well, we see that in a lot of different aspects, too. Um, you know, there's and and we, we, we still have a, a couple of questions that we're going to get through, but, you know, just to, to touch on that. <laughs> do you think <laughs> <laughs> this is this is yeah, really long? <laughs> it, it is. And, and I know you said you didn't have a hard stop, um, but. Uh, well, I will in about 20 okay, more minutes. Okay. Well, then I won't touch on, on the point that I was about to make. Um Let's move on from that so I can touch on yeah. these next two uh, questions. Uh, yeah. For for anybody watching who's interested in that stuff, it's a very active area of discussion. Just go Google things like DMCA circumvention or, <laughs> you know, any of that kind of thing. There's tons and tons of stuff out there on it. Uh, so, so, side note, like I, I also do um, – a, I'm running a, a limited series on on our site, which is specifically to uh, NFT MMOs. It's you know the MMO NFT because mm -hmm. there are a lot of MMOs in in production right now. So I I cover a yep. lot of stuff related to ownership and things like that. I've been covering what's been going on with with Axie because that's currently probably one of the largest games, um, including you know their retooling of their economy based on you know like uh, obviously like you said you saw it coming. Um, well, they're living it right now, trying to retool it. So, uh, you know, yep. there, there's a lot going on in that space that, that, uh, I've spent a lot of my time, um, trying to understand and then trying to convey to other players because, you know, the technology itself, you know, gets demonized so much and it's not necessarily the technology that is an issue. Uh, it's just how developers are utilizing it, especially in the blockchain space, which is one of the questions that I had, and I don't think that we're going to necessarily have time for it right now. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to touch on the two uh, questions that I have related to yeah. uh, cloud native, the cloud native aspects of your game. Sure. Um, but just so you know, in you know, at some point in the future, if we get a chance to talk again, uh, yeah. I really would love to talk yeah. about that kind I, of stuff. I, 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 can, I can sum up my take, which is that blockchain fundamentally is a currently relatively slow, fairly expensive, completely public read-only ledger database. Right? Like, it's a write-once-read-many ledger. Are there applications for write-once-read-many public ledgers? Absolutely. We rely on them in the real world for all kinds of things. Your school records are that. Property ownership records are that. Um, uh, I mean, it just, I could go on and on and on. We rely on those for all sorts of things. Okay. There are cases of, pro of property ownership where we rely on them. Most of the time, we don't bother. OK, like there is exactly a ledger like that for every VIN, every vehicle identification number. That is how we can look up the value of a car because it has, a, a you know, a, an indestructible read ledger that has its complete service history and accident history. So are there applications? Absolutely. Like there's no doubt about it. Right. Are these the right applications? That's a different question. <laughs> And at that point, you have to, you know, just be pragmatic about it um, and, and you know, evaluate on a case yeah, by case. Exactly, exactly. Um, so 
One of the major aspects of the Playable Worlds design is that it will be cloud native. Um, so generally speaking, do you believe that the way that metaverses are built should rely on a cloud native approach? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, it's it's sort of crazy to think of a metaverse that is client-centric or client-first, right? I mean, at, at that point, most of what you think about metaverse-wise can't happen. Um, so right off the bat, we all tend to assume a server. We're all connected to it. Well, I, there's this dirty secret about cloud. Cloud is just servers. That That's all it actually is. So... It, it, that's like saying, oh, MMOs are, are server native. Yes, they are. But it is kind of in the definition of what they are. So, yes. Um, what the cloud really means is about, um, it really means a whole bunch of things about elastic compute capability. And when people say elastic compute, what they really mean is, hey, there's enough server hardware up there that we can just launch more server processes and shut them down based on demand. That's what that actually ends up meaning. Um, saying then that your MMO is cloud native, I'll give you one example. When we had to allocate hardware on a permanent basis and buy it, that is how you ended up with shards. And if you can dynamically launch more server processes on the fly, then you may not need to have shards. That's an example of what taking advantage of elastic compute can give in a very pragmatic, straightforward way to MMO players, right? That's an example of, of the sort of thing that saying, no, let's be native to the environment really means. Well, one thing that's that's that people think of whenever they think of cloud, cloud native is, you know, they think, well, you know, like you said, are, you're not going to be essentially uh, housing so much on the, you know, on, on the client side, right? Um, but a lot of people worry that wh whenever you get into the aspects of, of housing everything on, on the server end, and, and really it's more of a perception issue because... Anytime you're connecting to a, a, a server, you're going to have issues uh, with, you know, latency, no matter if it's client side or server side or whatever. Um, but, you know, with the cloud native nature of some games or experiences, uh, you know, some players may not. Some players may feel as though there's a kind of disadvantage to like competitive play. Um, are there any disadvantages that players would noticeably see over there having are. something client yeah. side? Yes, there absolutely are. There, there are trade-offs, right? I think the fundamental thing first that we all have to accept is for any of these games, no server, no game. So that's just up front. So the thing about that, though, is um, that means most of the big things we can't do anything about. Sure, we can ship you art, but the art it's not going to do anything, right? Without there being a server with the rules. Um, in order to improve performance, we can ship art in advance rather than streaming it. The mental shift there is to think that a disk is actually a cache that we populated in advance. Right? Like that's your mental model change, right? Oh, it's an install. No, it's not an install. It's a pre populated cache. You, you know, that there's a mental difference there that leads you to think of it in a little bit of a different way. Um, how smart a client can be about doing things that only need to happen locally is another example, right? Like in all MMOs, pretty much. You tell the client, hey, start playing the rain effect. And the client's in charge of playing the rain effect after that. And then we tell it when to stop, right? Now, a client doesn't decide to do it on its own. It's still being driven by the server. But you're, you're not incurring, like, network traffic and latency for every freaking raindrop, right? Like, that kind of thing. So the most obvious place where that impacts players is movement. And, I mean... Everybody watching this is deeply familiar with this. The more you put on the server, the safer it is, but also less performant. 
the more you put on the client, it can be more performant and is going to get hacked. And there is like, there, those are the only two answers. Like there's no in between there, really. <laughs> you you got to, you know, for any given thing, you have to decide. If we say the rain is a client side effect, then that means somebody will write a hack that turns off rain <laughs> and oh well, <laughs> we can't do anything about it, right? Like that's just how it is. Fighting that battle is, I mean, it's the story of client server based technology in general. Um, how far has that battle gone? It's gone to the extent of anti cheat software. How far has anti cheat software gone? People don't remember where there was this huge scandal where Sony Music had put root kits on your audio CDs that basically installed themselves underneath the layer of your operating system and could monitor everything you did, and everybody was totally outraged. Well, that's anti-cheat software. <laughs> anti-cheat software is you voluntarily signing up to have your computer hacked and monitored so that, you know... You know, if that comes with the game install and you get root kitted, then you don't end up with people running hacks. Yeah. And we choose to trade away <laughs> the integrity of our machine for knowing that people won't use a wall hack or an aim bot or whatever. <laughs> That's the trade off. <laughs> so the other trade off then is going to be round trip time, right? And if you want to be. You know, the absolutely pure model, the completely 100% pure server-driven model is everything is a round-trip verified to the server, and the client is not trusted in any way and doesn't get to do anything. But that means round-trip latency to do anything. That's the absolutist model on the other end. It used to be that was completely untenable, so nobody could do it. We actually did it on MetaPlace, and by and large, nobody noticed. <laughs> and that's just because the internet got good enough. And now, would you have been able to make a fighting game that relies on 15 millisecond reaction times that way? Nope. No. no. So there's just a physical limit there. We're not going to be able to solve speed of light, right? Like, that's just not happening. <laughs> um but, you know, the Internet's dramatically faster than it used to be. We are seeing in game tech more willingness to put things on the server with round trip because we can do it now. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there, there isn't a really a clear answer there. I would say you're not going to see a cloud native fighting yeah. game. You're not going to see a, cl a fully, truly cloud native um, eSport of a Twitch esport for a while, right? But a slower paced esport, absolutely, right? Something a little more cerebral or that anything that has a, I mean, pings these days, plenty of people have pings sub 100 yeah. milliseconds. So if, it, I mean, there's all kinds of games that fit with 100 millisecond latency, all kinds of things, even fairly action-y things. So, yeah, that's just entirely about what are you making? Can you do it that way? Excellent. Uh, well, that was the last question that we have time for. We hope you enjoyed our interview with Raf Koster. Now that you've learned a little more about what a metaverse is, are you excited to see one finally come to fruition? Are you looking forward to Playable World's cloud-native sandbox MMO? Drop into the comments and let us know.